Welcome to Pharma Drama, the channel where we look at the science of healthcare and healthcare products. Today we're going to look in detail at solubility, and in particular why there are different types of solubility, ideal, intrinsic and just plain old solubility. Are they the same or different? Eh, spoiler alert, different. And do all compounds have all these types of solubility? The best way to find out is to get yourself a drink. I have dissolved coffee to its solubility and let's make a start. Before we look at the different definitions of solubility, let's first define what we mean by solubility in the first place. Otherwise, we'll never understand the different types. When we dissolve a compound, which I'm assuming is a solid, into a solvent, usually water for pharmaceuticals, but the principle applies to all solvents, we create a solution. The compound we have dissolved is called the solute, and we define how much solute there is in a given volume of solvent with a concentration. And incidentally, if you're not sure about concentrations, and you would not be alone, I have a video for that, the link for which is in the description below. As we add more solute to our solution, the concentration will increase. If the solute creates a colour, we will see that as an ever darker solution, just like this. Can we keep adding solute ad infinitum to make an ever more concentrated solution? Um, no. At some point, we will reach a limit where the solvent has accommodated as many solute molecules as it can. And if we add more solid, it can't dissolve anymore. We have reached the maximum concentration we can, and this concentration is called the solubility. If you want to delve into solubility in a bit more detail, I made a video on it, which you can also find a link to in the description below. For now, all you need to know is the solubility is the maximum concentration we can achieve for a given compound in water. It does apply to all other solvents, but I'm going to assume water for the rest of the video. So, why then do we also have other types of solubility, like ideal solubility and intrinsic solubility? To understand that, we need to look in a bit more detail how molecules dissolve in water in the first place. I said already that I'm assuming the material we're dissolving in water is a solid. If it's a crystalline solid, then all the molecules it contains are arranged in a repeating pattern and are held tightly together with strong intermolecular bonds. The strength of these bonds is termed the crystal lattice enthalpy. The higher the crystal lattice enthalpy, the stronger the bonds that hold the molecules together in the crystal structure. This is important because in order to dissolve something in water, first we need to break the molecules free from the crystal lattice. And the stronger the bonds, the harder that is. This is one reason why the solubilities of polymorphs of a compound are different, and the solubility of the most stable form, in other words, the form with the strongest bonds, is the lowest. If you think about it, breaking all the intermolecular bonds in a material so that it can dissolve is no different from breaking all the intermolecular bonds in a material when it melts. We call the energy required to melt a crystalline material the enthalpy of fusion. So the first step in dissolving a crystalline material is to break all the bonds holding the molecules together, and the energy needed to do this is the enthalpy of fusion. Once the molecules are free from the crystal lattice, the next thing they must do is form bonds with the solvent molecules. You may not have thought much about it, I kind of hope you haven't, but molecules don't just float about in water like you would in a swimming pool. Rather, a number of water molecules surround a molecule of solute and form bonds with it, forming a solvation shell, and we say that our solute molecule is solvated. The fact that solute molecules have this solvation shell is also very important. For one thing, it means that the molecule that has dissolved is not a single entity at all. Rather, we must remember that each molecule of solute is attached to a number of molecules of solvent, 
and it is this collection of molecules that is dissolved. For another, it means that all the molecules of water that are bound in the solvation shell are no longer free to move about like molecules of bulk water. They are essentially bound to the molecule of solute. This effectively reduces the number of free solvent molecules and is what leads to the concept of activity rather than concentration, although that is a topic for another day. And finally, and I hope you can see this already, it means that in order to dissolve well in water, a compound needs to be able to form bonds with water molecules. The more bonds with water can form, and the stronger those bonds are, the easier it will be for a molecule to become solvated. Easier solvation means greater solubility. Like we quantified the strength of intermolecular bonds in a crystalline lattice with the enthalpy of fusion, we can also quantify the strength of intermolecular bonds with solvent with another enthalpy, in this case the enthalpy of mixing. Now, what does this all mean? Well, it means we can define the enthalpy change upon dissolution of a compound in water, which we term the enthalpy of solution, as the sum of the enthalpy of fusion and the enthalpy of mixing. How do these terms affect solubility, I hear you ask? Well, for a process to occur spontaneously, we usually want an overall exothermic or negative change in enthalpy. I know there's an entropic term, but let's not overcomplicate things here. In the first step of dissolution, we must break all the bonds holding the molecules in the crystal lattice. This always requires energy to be added. So the enthalpy of fusion term is always positive, endothermic or energy put in. Hence, for dissolution to proceed, we really need the enthalpy of mixing term to be large and negative. In other words, a strongly favorable interaction between solute and solvent. If this is the case, then dissolution is thermodynamically favoured. If the enthalpy of mixing is positive, however, that is, there is an unfavourable interaction between solute and solvent, then the overall enthalpy of solution will be positive, and dissolution will only occur if there is a large entropic contribution. I hope you can see, therefore, that the chemical structure of the compound we are dissolving is very important. If it has functional groups that can form hydrogen bonds with water, then the enthalpy of mixing should be strongly exothermic, and that is good. This is why polar molecules dissolve well in water. On the other hand, if the compound cannot form hydrogen bonds with water, then the enthalpy of mixing will be strongly endothermic and it won't dissolve well at all. You might say to me at this point, uh, hang on a minute, Simon. You're supposed to be telling us about intrinsic and ideal solubility. Why are you going on about all this thermodynamic stuff? And that, frankly, is a good question. The answer is because now we have all the knowledge we need to actually talk about intrinsic and ideal solubility. Let's start with ideal solubility. This is a special case where the enthalpy of mixing is zero. In other words, the compound we are trying to dissolve doesn't interact either favourably or unfavourably with water. This is interesting because it allows us to derive this equation. I won't derive it here because that doesn't add anything to our discussion, but I've added a link in the description below should you wish to understand it. What's important is that this equation allows us to calculate ideal solubility if we know the melting temperature and enthalpy of fusion of our crystalline solid. And handily, both of these values are easily determined with a simple DSC measurement. It's easy to calculate the ideal solubility for a given compound. But is it useful? That is more of a moot point. Is the ideal solubility we calculate actually related to the solubility we would measure experimentally? Almost never. Why do you think that is? Hmm. I'm gonna give you a moment, think about that. It's because the enthalpy of mixing is almost never zero. 
But what calculating ideal solubility does allow is a comparison with measured solubility. And this allows us to see if there's a favorable, the measured solubility is higher than ideal, or unfavorable, the measured solubility is lower than ideal, interaction between our compound and water. We can also measure solubilities in a range of solvents and see where the enthalpy of mixing approaches zero. Here are some data for aspirin solubility in a range of solvents. You can see that the ideal solubility and solubility in THF are almost the same, while the solubility of aspirin in water is massively lower than ideal. In other words, there is a strongly unfavorable interaction between aspirin molecules and water. That leaves intrinsic solubility. That is also a special case, this time for compounds that ionize in water, like acids and bases. I said just now there will be a favorable interaction between polar compounds and water, and there's nothing more polar than an ionized compound. So when an acid or base dissolves in water and ionizes, the solubility will increase because the ions form very strong bonds with water. If you're familiar with acid or base chemistry, then you'll know the solubility of acids and bases changes with pH. Acids are usually more soluble at higher pH values and bases at lower pH values. This is why the degree to which the acid or base is ionized changes with pH and this changes solubility. When we measure solubility experimentally, we can't distinguish between ionized and unionized molecules. We just measure the total concentration dissolved. But sometimes it helps us to know what the solubility is of the unionized compound. This is, if you like, its true solubility. And we call this value the intrinsic solubility. So when we measure the solubility of compounds that ionize, we should remember that we are measuring the concentration of everything, ionized and unionized molecules. But if we want to know the true solubility of the parent molecule, then that is the solubility of the unionized species, and we call that the intrinsic solubility. We would measure that at low pH values for acids and high pH values for bases, in case you're wondering. Right, that's probably saturated your brain, so I think we need to wrap up. Solubility is the maximum concentration of a given compound we can achieve in a solvent, usually water, and is the experimentally measured value. Ideal solubility is the special case where we assume the enthalpy of mixing is zero and we calculate it. By comparing ideal solubility with experimentally measured values, we can see whether there is a favorable or an unfavorable interaction between our compound and the solvent. And finally, we should recognize that if a compound can ionize, its solubility in water will increase. When we measure the solubility of the unionized compound, we consider that the true or intrinsic solubility. I hope you found that useful. If you did, please hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and please tell your friends about the channel. All of that really helps. Thank you. And if there are topics you'd like me to discuss, please leave a comment below. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you again soon.